Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about mechanisms and uh, different patterns of error pushing. There are four most common types of error pushings and obviously that's that organics are not only limited to those only four types, you will see other types in there, but those are four error pushings are going to be the most common you're going to be seeing and those are going to be the most important to understand. So this first type of pattern where you're going to have a nucleophile and it's going to attack something and uh, now you got to think about it what it's really going to attack. Well remember nucleophile is something that's going to have a lone pair of electrons or a negative charge and it's going to be attacking an electrophile which have a positive center. So in this particular case my oxygen, since that's the only one carrying your uh, electrons, it's going to be your nucleophilic center. And this positive charge on the other compound, on the carbon, is going to be your electrophilic center. So I'm going to have an arrow going from your, electro uh, from your nucleophilic center to the electrophilic center. Make sure these arrows are curved arrows. They are not uh, supposed to be the straight arrows because the straight arrows are uh, meant to for the reaction direction. So when I go ahead and attack this oxygen, uh, the lone pair on the oxygen onto that positive, positively charged carbon, my product is going to look like this. We got an oxygen. Now it's still going to have one electron pair. The other electron pair the oxygen is using to make the bond with that carbon. So I can go ahead and change the color of that uh, second molecule there. So I'm going to have um, something like this. So now remember, you must conserve your charge as well. You started out with a positive charge in the second molecule of the reactant. So you must have a positive charge at the end of the day on your product side. In this case, this oxygen is the one that's making three bonds now. So it's going to have a formal charge of plus one. So that's how it's going to look like. Now let's look at maybe uh, another example. So in another example, I got this SH1 minus, and I am attacking um, this nucleophile. So obviously this is going to be acting as your nucleophile. You can call that nuke. And then this, where is your electrophile going to be? Uh, when I'm looking at my second compound here, I got a carbon chlorine bond. So remember your carbon chlorine bond is going to be polar, where chlorine is going to be partial negative and carbon is going to be partial positive. Now keep in mind this carbon already has four bonds in there and you're not seeing the hydrogen there but remember there is an hydrogen in there. In the previous case that carbon has a positive charge so it has only three bonds in there so that's why you were able to attack onto that particular carbon. Now here this partially positively charged carbon is still going to be acting as your electrophilic center. The only difference between the previous one and this one is when I do attack here, so we got lone pair attacking here, I can't really have a bond made between the sulfur and the carbon only because it's going to exceed in valency. Uh, carbon already has four bonds, so something must be leaving along the side there. And in this case, the chlorine is going to be the one that's going to be leaving, and that's going to be leaving with that uh, bond that's made between the carbon and the chlorine. So at the end of the day, I'm still going to have my carbon, and then now I got this SH attached, and then you're going to have the chloride left. So you're still conserving the charge when you're going from left to right and uh, you're going to be making a new compound here and obviously this uh, also going to have a hydrogen there but remember you don't really have to specify the hydrogens on the carbons and the skeletal structures but I'll just go ahead and draw it out just so that you see that I'm not really losing that hydrogen. That hydrogen is going to be on the reactant and on the product as well. What if you have maybe another example here. So I got uh, water that's having the lone pairs here. So that's going to be your nucleophile. And then where is going to be your electrophile? Well, clearly we got a carbonyl. So remember, a carbonyl bond is going to be polar. You got a partial negative on the oxygen and a partial positive on the carbon there. And you can say the same thing. The chlorine is also electronegative, so it's going to be a partial negative as well there. So when I'm doing the attack there, it's going to be starting from the nucleophile and it's going to be going on to that electrophilic carbon. And then again, this carbon already has four bonds, so I'm not going to be able to make a fifth bond there. 
um, but instead you must something must break and usually if you do have a pi bond the pi bond is the one that's going to be broken first so in this case before the chlorine leaves like we have the chlorine left in the previous example eventually this chlorine would leave but before that leaves this pi bond is going to be the one that gets broken first so this pi bond gets broken first and it's going to go on the oxygen as a lone pair. So this is how it's going to look like. Then I got uh, part of the structure to be similar. Now this oxygen is going to have three lone pairs with a negative charge. And then I got this oxygen here, this water attached here, something like this. So now this water is making three bonds here and obviously it's still going to have one lone pair. So you're going to have a positive charge there. So if you look in the initially in the molecule, there was no formal charge on any of the elements. So the net charge on the reactant side was zero. When you do make the product, you get a formal charge of minus one on the oxygen and you get a formal charge of plus one on the oxygen of the water here. But overall, it's still going to be a formal charge of zero. Uh, overall, it's still going to be a net charge of zero. And that's one thing you always want to make sure that you're not really changing the net charge. What about this next one here? Remember your nucleophiles could also be the pi bonds. In this particular case, the pi bond is the one that's going to be acting as a nucleophile. So this nucleophile is going to be attacking the electrophile. And what's going to be the electrophile here? Remember your protons are also can act as an electrophile. So they're just called acids as well. So in this case, it's going to grab that proton and this bond between the hydrogen and chlorine is going to break and that's going to go up there and now I'm going to have a new molecule there so then remember this hydrogen is going to go somewhere so I, I can call this uh, carbon 1 call this carbon 2 so this carbon it, this hydrogen is either going to be bonded to carbon 1 or carbon 2 and uh, that really depends on um, something called the stability of the carbocations and uh, the other carbon is going to be becoming the electron deficient because this pi bond is going to be used to make the bond with the hydrogen and it typically goes with the terminal carbon and I'll, we'll talk about why it does that maybe in a different session because uh, that has to do with the Markovnikovs and anti-Markovnikovs rule. So I'll go ahead and draw the other hydrogens there as well. Remember there's two other hydrogens on that first carbon and there was one hydrogen on the second carbon just to kind of see how the things are kind of going there and then what happens to this second carbon now this second carbon all of a sudden has only three bonds so it becomes electron deficient so as a result this is the one that's going to be getting the positive charge so this particular one I can redraw it if I want without the hydrogens but having the positive charge on this second carbon and then obviously you're going to have the Cl minus being made there. So this is going to be your uh, secondary carb cation. Now how do you know when the carb cation is secondary or tertiary? Well you look at the carbon that's bearing the positive charge and then you look around how many more carbons that particular carbon is going to be attached to. So I got one carbon here and the second carbon there. So since it's attached to two other carbons, this particular carbocation is going to be the secondary carbocation. So that's your one pattern of uh, um, error drawings, error pushings. The other one is going to be the loss of leaving group. You could have a good leaving group, and if in those cases you could lose the leaving group like this, and uh, I could leave... I could have this carbon and chlorine bond breaks and the reason why it really breaks is the polarity at the end of the day because remember this carbon is still partial positive and this chlorine is still partial negative. Along with having the polarity you must have a good leaving group. Um, the halogens like chlorine, bromine, iodine, they are good leaving groups so you can get rid of those and in doing so what's going to happen? Well what's going to be left behind on the chain is an electron deficient carbon so that's going to get a positive charge and then this chlorine is going to go away with the extra electron so that gets a negative charge now what kind of carbocation is that well it's actually similar to the one we just drawn earlier so it's still going to be the secondary carbocation what about this next example well clearly in the next example I can have this bromine leaving because remember 
Uh, bromine is another halogen that's a good leaving group and uh, the bond between the carbon and the bromine is going to be polar. So when that happens, you're going to have a carbon chain now where one of the carbons is going to be the electron deficient. So this is going to get a positive charge and then you're going to have Br minus here. So remember your charges must still be conserved when you're going from reactants to products. You had no net charge on the reactants, but then on the product you get one compound with a positive charge, the other one with a negative charge. So overall, still no net charge. And when I'm looking at uh, what type of carbocation that's going to be, well clearly if I'm focusing on the carbon that's bearing the positive charge, how many other carbons it's attached to? I got one here, I got second here, and I got third here. So since it's attached to thir three carbons, it's going to be the tertiary carbocation. So that's how you figure those out. Uh, the other one is going to be the proton transfer. And this is very similar to the acid-base uh, mechanisms that we have done earlier. So proton transfers for the most part is going to be uh, two arrows where you're going to have a base. So in this case, the water is the one that's going to be acting as a base. And it's going to be attacking that proton. And then in doing so, this bond between the uh, hydrogen and the chlorine is going to break where the electron goes on to the chlorine. So I get a oxygen now with three hydrogens like this and obviously with a positive charge and then I get chloride with a negative charge. This is the same as you done in the bronson lowry acid and base mechanism. So where you have two arrows, one starts from the base, goes on to grab the proton, and the other arrow is going to be the bond broken between the hydrogen and whatever element it's making the bond with. This next example, well, where is going to be your base? Well, clearly I can see there's two lone pairs on that oxygen, and since there's two lone pairs on that oxygen, and I can clearly see this is going to be your acid because you got that as a hydronium ion. So I can have one of the lone pairs attacking that proton here and then in doing so the bond between the hydrogen and oxygen is going to break and it's going to go down here on the oxygen to restore the electron density. So then how your product is going to look like, well clearly we're going to have still a double bond on the oxygen but now you have used one of the lone pairs on the oxygen to make a new bond with the hydrogen. And then you get a still one lone pair on the oxygen, but now all of a sudden this is going to have a positive one formal charge. And then you're going to have water just alone by itself. So you started out with an, a positive one or plus one net charge on the reactant side. You still have an, a plus one of net charge on the product side. So that's your proton transfer. Like I said, very it's going to be the same as the bronson lowry acid-base uh, arrow pushing mechanism. What about this last one? You could possibly see in a carbocation rearrangement and that would happen anytime you have a possibility of making a more stable carbocation. For example, in this particular case, I'm dealing with a secondary carbocation because I got this carbon that's bearing the positive charge is in turn attached to two other carbons only. Now, if I can somehow move this positive charge onto this new location, so I'll make that arrow there, and I'll take that out in a minute, then you could have a tertiary carbocation. And now, how would you really move that? Well, you're going to have to do some sort of carbocation rearrangement where I know there's uh, two metal groups attached onto that particular carbon, but then there is another hydrogen attached to it. So this particular one is going to be called in a 1-2 hydride shift. And uh, the way it works, you're going to have this hydrogen along with the bond going on to here. So when it goes on to that uh, position where the positive charge is, how your product is going to look like? Well, all of a sudden, the positive charge or the previous positive charge where that was the secondary carbocation now has the hydrogen so now it's electron efficient or there's no electron deficiency in there but that wherever you're moving the hydrogen from that becomes electron deficient so this is going to be getting the positive charge now so this is going to be your 
tertiary carbocation and obviously you know you may not have to write this like that you could also write it without the hydrogen and that's going to be the most common way of uh, doing it you just have to understand that there is going to be a hydride shift going from the reactants to products and you would do that again anytime you are in the condition of making a tertiary carbocation from a secondary carbocation and even whenever you have like resonances being taken place but remember your tertiary carbocation is going to be more stable than the secondary carbocation and then let's about uh, let's look at this one uh, next one right here i still have in a secondary carbocation but then uh, if i can move it onto this new location then i could possibly create a tertiary carbocation the only issue here is I don't really have any hydrogen like I had earlier. So it's not only the hydrogen that could shift, you could also shift in the alkyl group. And in this case, we're going to be shifting the methyl group. So I can have this methyl group along with this bond kind of shifting onto this new location. And that's going to be called in a 1-2 methyl shift. And then this methyl shift, once that happens, this is how your new compound is going to look like so remember this is the one that has shifted so that was this right there and now has moved on to the new location and in doing so what's going to happen you're going to have the positive charge right there so this is going to be making an a tertiary carbocation so you could see a hydride shift could see in a metal shift whenever you're doing these rearrangements so those are your four most common error pushing patterns you're going to be seeing it's extremely important to be able to understand, be able to identify what's really going on in those arrow pushings, and it, you get better with practice. If you have any questions on those, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.